the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. I'll continue with that. Thank you, Madam Chair. And <coughs> so I, I wanted to address a couple things also related to the counseling point before we move on. Um, on the very first point is that I think it would be extraordinarily beneficial for our counseling and our psychological services and our faculty to have a little bit more communication. I'm not sure exactly how that's gonna come about. However, with the increased availability of resources for counseling services, for example, for educational planning or for assessment, what I guess the students are hoping to see is also an increased individualized attention to students. And um, as the gentleman from Sacramento City College said earlier, Early warning systems are extraordinarily effective. I was a student in private school, so I attended a Catholic high school in Senator Lou's district. At St. Francis High School, we had an early warning system that told a student when they were about to fail, when they were in danger of failing. And that was the necessary thing. They asked, what do you need to succeed? What are the resources we can give you to make sure that you move towards success? And those are the things that I saw in a lot of successful transfer organizations. And those institutions are successful because they are giving an individual touch. Students need individual influences in their lives that are gonna motivate them towards success. And if we can't really influence the peers around them and the guidance they're giving them, then the best thing we can do is offer a mentor in the form of our counseling. Another thing I'd like to mention is that there are a couple programs that are gonna be negatively impacted by the Board of Governors fee waiver changes. There are specifically several majors that are high unit. So uh, a lot of them happen to be STEM majors, but what happens is a student will embark on their educational journey with the expectation of trying to reach completion. And on the way to completion, there are bumps in the road. I've had a few friends in classes that have had to appeal financial aid three times, four times, just to basically receive what they need while they progress on their academic goals. And they fall into two categories for the most part. First is students who are just diligently pursuing the same goal and it just happens to be a very high unit major. Usually if you have to take a ton of different maths and sciences, all of which build on each other, you're gonna have a lot more units that are gonna add up. And the second is someone who changes their educational goal. So for example, I've been in the system for about, this is my sixth year. I changed my goals. I, I originally was trying to just um, receive general education, and then I looked at all, all the opportunities that my peers were having when they were transferring and all of the job opportunities that were coming of it, and saw a counselor and basically changed my destination. Students like me, who are actually a little bit more at, proactive at seeking their goals, are now looking at being above the 100 unit cap because they've changed their majors. Mm -hmm. So. We do appreciate that there is an appeals process. Strengthening that appeals process and making sure that it works and is successful is something we're gonna have to be looking at looking forward and we're hoping that the students are involved in that conversation. And I think that I, I've covered just about everything I needed to, so <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then last off, I just wanna cover some, some information that may help you in your case. Um, so, over the years, our students have um, spoken to us uh, via resolutions with our organization. We hold a general assembly twice a year, or essentially have a bunch of ideas, write them in a resolution form, and get them voted on by all of our colleges that attend. Um, we've been told throughout the years, um, through resolutions, having our own board speaking to students, and, and some of the perspectives that they brought us, and there's three points I'll be bringing up that I think if we actually look towards may potentially help us with our success rates and providing more students to go through the system quicker. Um, first off, I'd like to speak on behalf of um, restoring and, and potentially expanding funding towards EOPS, DSPS categorical programs and student success programs like Puente, uh, Emoja Scholars, and programs for uh, API students, veterans, and uh, AB 540 students. Um, 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 these programs really help out folks who are disadvantaged in our system. Uh, a lot of these folks are uh, first-generation college students, low-income um, folks that 
uh, you know, going through high school weren't even seen as uh, going to college. I know when I was in high school, my counselors never spoke to me about attending uh, four-year institutions or even community colleges. That was never an option for me. I was, you know, essentially just going to go work with my father in carpentry uh, if it wasn't for the fact that my brother reached out to me and told me, you know, hey, you know, education is difficult, but you can still go to the community college nearby and work on pursuing your education and benefiting your life. Um, these programs not only help folks in their academic process, but also help out with their professional development. Um, they provide uh, services uh, like um, building the resumes, providing them information about internship programs, uh, essentially things that may help benefit them in their professional goals. Um, they also help out in, I would say, non-tuition expenses. Um, I mean, folks like to talk about um, students complaining about or students having issues with tuition, but honestly, there are a lot of other costs that come out with transportation, worrying about paying for your rent, uh, food, and what have you. And these programs do help provide, um, you know, book loan programs, helping provide resources for students so that they aren't starving at night and actually getting food stamps or even helping them get their own health care, um, helping, you know, essentially pay for things, uh, providing them discount, you know, transportation services and stuff like that. And it, those definitely go a long way with helping out the student because they're not solely worrying about in the classroom, they're also worrying about how am I going to, you know, move on to the next day. Um, and I, I feel like we need to uh, restore funding to these programs across the board in the state as well as expand it. Um, when I was at Messenger College, I was in the EOPS department and uh, essentially students were being um, pushed away because unfortunately they were understaffed and could not take any more students. Um, and it's really difficult to, for the seeing that happen and seeing fellow students not being able to come in and being provided one-on-one -on -one opportunities with um, counselors or staff members to help out with their educational plan and helping out with their resume or just, just overall helping them out in any type of situation. Um, second, um, something else our students have spoken to us about and have really been encouraging us, especially last year, is providing um, funding for part-time faculty hours as well as full-time uh, uh, staff hiring. Um, in my perspective or in my situation, um, again, when I was in medicine year college, um, one of my best professors I ever had was an individual named Paul Muncy, and he was a history professor. Uh, and when taking his course, it was rather difficult to speak to him because he had to share an office space with six other part-time faculty members. And essentially, he would have to go out of his own pocket and meet with students at a local cafe in downtown Modesto um, just for us to come reach out to him and speak to him. And, and that's very essential for students because because uh, whenever you're having issues, I, I mean, it's, it's rather difficult for you to go over questions or problems or even help prepare for the next exam if you don't have the resource to speak to your professor or ask a basic question that he would know the answer to. And so that also affects students for not being able to have that access anytime with their professor. And honestly, consider, and, and also the issue with full-time faculty, um, if you've seen across the board in our system, uh, a majority or vast majority of our faculty members are part-time faculty. These individuals are not guaranteed, uh, you know, a position at their districts. Many times they are um, moonlighting or having second jobs at um, local school districts and what have you. And so it's rather difficult for them to go from a community college to also go um, teach students in the K through 12 system or even a, a third job or a job that has nothing to do with education and then still be invested in students. Um, again, with uh, Mr. Uh, Muncie and several other part-time faculty members at um, the Assembly Community College District at Medicine Senior College, they felt that they were um, not being provided the resources to help benefit their students and could no longer continue doing their efforts. And so in protest, they, res they resigned uh, from working with the district because they felt that they weren't being provided the resources that they needed. And there are similar stories like that going across the board, which is part-time faculty members, you know, not feeling that they have a guaranteed spot in their district or their community college and, and not being provided the resources to help out their students. Um, so that's something that is a concern for our students. And uh, finally, um, and this is something that students have uh, talked about as well, is um, providing more, I guess, funding towards library and learning resource centers. Um, for example, um, if you look at the CSU and UC systems, uh, a lot of them have library office, or sorry, look, library hours 24 access or at least expanded access for students so that they can come in, um, use the reserve section and use the, the book loan program that they have or be even able to speak to a librarian who can help them out with their research skills and, and, and determining how they should go about um, researching for their topics or essays or what have you. And unfortunately, um, in the community college system, not all you know, you know or not all community colleges or even districts have office hours open late for students. Um, and that's a huge concern considering, you know, the students need a safe place for them to study, and at times students have to go to Starbucks or what have you to do so because they can't study at home. Um, as well as um, expanding on tutoring programs. Um, so right now, uh, a lot of community colleges have it to where they use um, 
part-time, or not part-time, but they use students who are being paid to the federal world work study or being paid by the college to go to the tutoring um, schedules. But unfortunately, these individuals are just like us. They are going to getting their education. They're also working for their families and they have their own obligations. So it's rather difficult for students to come in and work with these tutors because they only have specific hours throughout the week to work on it. And so I think to help out students and, and help them out with, with situations with their student success, we should potentially provide more funding into those type of programs to either um, one, um, increase the tutoring size so that folks um, can have, so that more folks can be um, coming into, or either uh, hire full-time individuals to be tutors so that when, whenever the library is open from eight to five or eight to 10, there's always someone on staff there to help them out with their problems. Because unfortunately, when you're ha having a tutor who only comes in Tuesdays and Thursdays from two to five to help out with your physics course or with your mathematics course, you know, some students can't go during that hours. We have class during that time. We have work during that time. And so that causes a hindrance as well, is that we're not being provided um, the resource or I guess the help with um, fellow peers or even just you know faculty members uh, on our campus with that. So uh, those are some issues that our students have told us um, time and time again and I, I think if we can actually invest in this, this would definitely benefit our students in the long run and eventually um, I guess help them speed through their educational process. <clears throat> Thank you very much all of you. Um, any questions, Dr. Pan? Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Senator Liu. Um, I, I, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I appreciate uh, many of the points you brought up. Uh, one thing that struck me, and actually I didn't ask the question when the chancellor presented, uh, though, that I uh, want to dig in just a little bit into. Um, you talked about uh, the fact that actually uh, people who are majoring in STEM or in others, they have they have the, the, the high credit burden. And I also noticed that one of the measures that the system's using is the so-called efficiency index, right? To see how efficient um, we're processing. And certainly you know, want to have more efficiency in the college, but I'm, I'm, and I haven't dug into the measure, so I'm not sure you know, in terms of how it operates. But one of the things I was concerned about was is that do we have a metric that then discourages um, classes or courses or people from going into things like STEM, um, health professional, health professions classes tend to be very inefficient because we, you can't expand class sizes very easily. You tend to have large lab components, right? Clinical components, you have STEM lab components. So if you have an efficiency index, it's like how many students can you get per professor or per course? Um, it's one thing to add in, you know, and there's mentoring and there's other advising issues that involve if you add another 10 students to a class in a classroom, what happens when you have a lab course and you don't have 10 extra benches, right? And then do those courses get penalized when uh, on the campus level? And then of course, obviously at the student level as well. Uh, so I guess it's more of a general question, but uh, um, but you know, I don't know if that's a concern that uh, um, that might be there. And if you're taking health or STEM classes? Well, do you want to go first? You can yeah. go first. Um, this is kind of to answer the question as a sure. as well, Madam Luce Chair uh, question. Yes, I've taken STEM classes, um, but my college is very fortunate. It's Foothill College is one of the colleges that are very well funded, especially in its STEM departments. Um, but going off of the um, Senator uh, Pan's question, um, I feel like the question as to whether there is a matrix that measures that is more appropriate for the system. I'm not aware of it as a student myself, uh, but that would be great. And that's what I was um, talking about with increasing our accountability towards uh, what are we actually doing to help our students. So if that means a matrix set up to see how many students per, per faculty, how many students per counselor there are, um, I mean, it could be a district thing, it could be a statewide thing. Uh, but uh, I know that, uh, for example, in um, some CTE classes, um, the cost of uh, the, the cost of the material, uh, such for nursing programs and like sometimes even textbooks can be very, very expensive. Um, and I know that um, we've recently put a lot of money into the workforce task force recommendations uh, regarding CTE programs. So I'm hoping that some of that money can go towards actually incentivizing our students going into these programs so we don't see the completion or enrollment going down in CTE uh, by helping them offset the costs of the re these resources, such mm -hmm. as their textbooks or materials. Um, but I'm not sure if that kind of ties into your question, but again, I'm not aware if there is a matrix, uh, but maybe my student. Well, I, I, th I think that it's, uh, we just want to be sure we don't have incentive structure that discourages um, students from going into STEM or actually places when we, we, on the health committee, which I also sit on, we talk about 
workforce shortages, right? And we need, uh, and so, and community colleges are training, you know, dental assistants and medical assistants and a lot of other health professionals and, and so forth. And so I'm just wanna be sure, I'm just wanna be sure we don't have an incentive structure at the system level that then actually discourages investment in campuses. In fact, in careers that there are jobs that students may wanna pursue that's gonna be through the community college and that we don't have a, a, a metric that actually discourages the you know, the campuses from investing in those because that will lower their efficiency because it, they're harder to expand. You know, it's harder to, to have efficiency in terms of, number of students per faculty that you can churn through and so forth when you have high intensity courses, right? Or even just doing away with seminar type courses where, you, where actually small group teaching is gonna be more effective. Okay. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I did also wanna respond. I don't think that there are incent, like disincentives to going into a STEM major. What we're really concerned about though is what happens once you've gotten to 90 units and or 100 units and your local district has a policy that you're cut off unless you undergo an appeals process. Um, certain students who are on like, let's say the borderline, they're getting C's or B's. Those students are much less likely to go through more bureaucracy to try to reach their educational goals. So even the slightest little impediment to bureaucracy, if you look at it on a broad scale of the system, is gonna deter at least a student. And so I think that's a big thing to look at. Another big thing to look at is that these STEM classes are typically going to be a lot more units. So a single failed attempt where you withdraw is going to count a lot more against you. So let's say you took a math class, it's gonna be five units, and something came up with your family. You withdraw from that, you've already taken five units, you take it again, that's 10 units. So there's just, it's just basically gonna add up a lot faster than a lot of the other majors. And I don't necessarily think that all of these are gonna even be STEM fields. There are other majors that are very high unit, and it, it's worthwhile to actually even potentially just have like a group of people take a look, figure out which units are high, like, courses or educational goals are gonna be high unit and deal with them as they come. I think an exemption for these specific high unit majors would do a lot to encourage students to continue, so. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. We'll take them to heart. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, time for public comment. We're gonna limit you to a minute I'd like you to join, line up, join us at the uh, podium here. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Austin Webster. I'm with the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. Uh, we would just like to briefly applaud all of our colleagues throughout the system for their tremendous efforts to assess and promote um, this student success throughout the community colleges here in California. Um, we'd also like to echo the comments made by the students and some others today, uh, really just stressing the importance of counselors, full-time faculty members, and part-time resources. Um, they're definitely a pivotal part of that student success model, and we just thank you all for your continued support. Thank you. Please. Hello, I'm Richard Hansen. I am here for the California Community College Independence. We are the um, uh, unaffiliated uh, faculty unions in the state. And first of all, I'd like to thank the legislature for the funding. That's a majorly uh, important thing. And I would just say that uh, what I, and I, I have to say that I was on the Student Success Task Force. And one of the things here is that we have a funding stream for instruction, but for student services, this is the big chance to do that. And we have to make it permanent and ongoing as, and as important as the instructional side. Uh, you heard comments about whether or not people uh, or districts are hiring counselors. That, and you heard that's a, that's a concern out there. So the more we can do to assure uh, those administrators that they're safe, uh, will improve the situation. Um, I also want to thank the Chancellor's Office for their efforts to make the SSSP and also equity work and be accountable. And I would say that when you look at that scorecard and you think about what the federal accreditors want to see, we're doing it here in California. Um, 
and back to my work on the task force, uh, the faculty, as you must know, uh, were critical and apprehensive about a lot of the, of the issues. And I think Senator Pan actually has spoken to a good deal of those sorts of thoughts today. Um, counselors and the human touch is especially important. Uh, they're, we, they can't be replaced by computers. Um, the college experience, too, is something that we're worried about. It shouldn't all be about efficiency. It shouldn't all be about getting a job. There's a lot of personal growth that has to go on. Uh, that's a part of the college experience that was guaranteed to Californians under the master plan. So I talk sometimes about getting back to the master plan, and I hope we could do that. Uh, we have a new generation of students, more diverse. We should give them more opportunities, not lesser. Um, and finally, unintended consequences. And I'll just give an example from my home district, Foothill and De Anza. Uh, we found that we were trying to follow the um, guidelines of encouraging full-time students, but what the counselors began to report was that part-time students had a hard time completing and because they lost their priority, full-timers had top priority. So actually both academic senates from the two colleges are now in the process of getting that fixed. The full-time students and part-time students will be at the same priority level. So that's the other thing too. As these things occur, we have to be flexible and we have to correct problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair, can I give this to the members of the committee before I begin? The uh, sergeants, please. I think, how many members are you for? There are just two of us right now, but there are others. Okay. Well, I brought a copy for each member. Okay. Is that appropriate then? Yeah. We'll make sure they get them. There's 13, right? There's nine members. Nine members. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Ricardo Gaudino. I'm the Director of Research and Design for Golden State History. Uh, what I'm giving you is our first design that is going out to 5,000 classrooms across California, eighth grade, third grade, and 11th. I think what the comment by this gentleman from Sacramento City College on the statistic of first-time students to go to college at 60% brings us to the fact of what we are working at Golden State History on for the last 20 years, which is that we have a reality of youth at risk to ignorance, of losing our history, of not knowing how their town and their nation is built. Now, I realize as a Bernays practitioner who was the founder of public relations, that analysis of social influences and those conclusions give us solutions to move forward. The solution we put on the table in 2006 was Senate Resolution 33 Pacific Maritime Routes. And I am almost done, I'm not gonna go on. The situation is that having the Super Bowl is a great thing for us because if you don't tackle, you don't win. So if we're going to construct learning, we have to have the essential foundation of our landscape in our minds to appreciate and be prepared. This is what we call basic knowledge. We need to have a standard that's ready. And that is why this legislative session with the bill already prepared by Ledge Council, leadership is needed from the Senate to introduce the Pacific Maritime Resolution as a bill. It was passed in 2006, but unless it is a law, it is not respected. I'm sorry to hear that. I thought it would be. And last year we kind of went through the motions. But if we all want to unify and have a foundation of knowledge that's our cornerstone to grow from, we have to tackle to win. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. 
Good afternoon, Lizette Everett with the Community College League of California. I just wanted to take a moment um, on behalf of the CEOs and trustees of our districts um, just to thank you for your longstanding commitment to student success and for the uh, for checking back on how student success is going. I think um, it's important for us to know that there are champions in the state legislature that are ensuring that uh, we are equipped with the resources, but also the knowledge and information on which direction the state wants to move. So I want to thank you um, and welcome opportunities to integrate student success in all of the efforts that uh, move forward within the legislature and, and keeping that in the forefront. So again, thank you for uh, taking time to hear the progress on these uh, important efforts. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, um, for another sorry, Victor Cost again. Um, <laughs> real quick, I just really want to thank um, everyone up here on the dais, um, you, Madam Chair, uh, and Senator Pan, and the other senators that were here to hear us on our perspective. And also just thank um, Staff Director Kathleen Chavira. If it wasn't for her, we would not be here at this opportunity to provide our own perspective. We came into her office to speak about our two bill proposals about providing student representation on, on CSAC and um, helping provide shower facilities for homeless students in our system. And she you know, reached out to me and said, we would really love to have the students come and speak on student success and let us know how it is for you and just you know we don't really get this opportunity very often and so we we really appreciate that you've allowed us to do this and especially since I mean we came out of our own dime up here and, and, and as students will always come up here on our own dime we always want to provide the perspective of the students and allow you to do your job uh, and allow us for us to succeed and, and pursue our you know our dreams so thank you thank you very much no problem. we want you to be successful yes Hi, my name is Elsa Maimas. I'm a student, and I apologize, I'm a bit nervous. It's okay. Um, but I was just hearing the conversation that was going on earlier, and I just wanted to share. I'm a political science major, and I'm actually, in my student representation, I found that I love what I do. But there was one point where I was thinking about chemistry, and I went to a, a chemistry class, but by then I understood enough about financial aid. I understood about the fact that the, my, the K through 12 system had not prepared me enough in, uh, in math that I would have to go back to the remedial and I knew the challenges that I would face if I pursued something in chemistry, and I just knew at that point it wasn't an option. So if I would have loved it more than political science, I don't know. I just know that's not a choice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Well, we're here by ourselves. Thank you very much for joining us today. Appreciate all of the input. Um, all of you who are working on this project, we really appreciate um, your work, and uh, I. We hope that uh, all of our kids will benefit from all of your efforts um, to make sure that we as Californians are going to continue our success. So thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>